How's it going, everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to the long-awaited return of the Professor Oak Challenge. I've been having a hankering of wanting to work on one of these again recently, and Pokemon Prism seems like the perfect place to pick back up on. Now, if you're not familiar with the Professor Oak's challenge, well, I'd suggest checking out some of my previous videos on the subject. I've done one in every single generation, barring a few omissions, as well as other ROM hacks and fan games, but it's rather simple. We just have to capture every Pokemon obtainable before each gym badge, with no trading or glitches allowed. Sounds simple, right? Well, I'm not so sure if that's the case. So let's see as I attempt to complete the Professor Oak's challenge in Pokemon Prism. But before we get started, make sure to throw a Pokeball at that subscribe button, make that red button turn gray. After all, 55% of viewers aren't subscribed, and I'm going to be pumping out a few of these videos before the release of Scarlet and Violet, so you don't want to miss them. Drop a like, let's aim for 2500 on here, and let's jump in. So Prism starts pretty interestingly compared to vanilla Pokemon games. We're in a camp with our mother who tells us to go get some firewood, a landslide breaks out making it so that I can't get back to her, and therefore have to go on an adventure to get all the gym badges and become the Pokemon champion. Yeah, strange premise, but I suppose I'll take it. Our first Pokemon is right up in the Aqua Mines as we try taking a minecart back to the camp, but we don't manage to make it all the way there. But we do find a Larvitar. Really sweet Pokemon. Tyranitar is probably my favorite Pokemon of all time, tied with Hydreigon. However, this is going to be HELL to train. Thankfully, Cool Boy Man, the creator of this hack, made it evolve at level 40 as opposed to level 55, so we should be saving a ton of time here. After taking out a rival with a bag on over on Route 69, nice, we're given the Pokedex and our first few Pokeballs, meaning it's time to start the challenge proper. At the end of the Aqua Mines is Caper City, and just north to that is Route 70, housing the likes of Ralts, which we'll need two of, one being male to get Gallade, Sentret, Caterpie, Zubat during the night, Paris, and Pidgey during the day. The way to change the time in this game is the same as you would in Crystal version, so simply using the same button command on the title screen and using the calculator with your name and current money will suffice. Once they're all saddled up in the party in PC, I can move slightly further north into the unnamed tunnel. This will be relevant later once we have the Rijon Pass, but for now I just have to capture Geodude, Machop, and Auron. The former's two's trade evolutions are obtainable, but only with a trade stone, which we can't get a hold of just yet. And the last of them is going to be even more difficult than Larvitar, thanks to evolving at a stark level 42. Ten Pokemon in hand, and I'm able to head east into Route 71 after a small ice puzzle, the home of Talo, Spearow, and Snowrun, which we'll need two of for both evolutions, one being female of course. This is more easily obtainable in the Clathrite Tunnel, but I found them rather fast, so I said screw it, why not just pick them up here? Speaking of the Clathrite Tunnel, it's then the gate between Routes 71 and 72, but I'll be coming back around at the end of this section to get those Pokemon down there. Route 72 itself, though, houses a good chunk of Pokemon as well, with Meryl, Lotad, Spinarak, and Natsu join in the brigade as we make it into Oxalis City, the home of our first gym leader. Of course, we've got a few other areas to cover before we can take on the leader Josiah and put him out of commission. Route 73 is the last available area of progression northward, housing a small patch of grass before we get arbitrarily blocked off by someone who's telling me that I'm not strong enough to pass, thankfully getting us access to Mareep, Vulpix, and Growlithe. Well, we can't get any Firestones yet, so I'm in no rush on those last two, but with Mareep, that's another level 30 evolution to add to the collection. One more area to worry about, and it's the aforementioned Clathrite Tunnel, giving me access to Swinub, Bronzor, and the nasty 1% encounter of Sneasel. Oddly enough, this hack omits Mamoswine though, so we won't be getting that, but we will have some more frustration to deal with in the future with Sneasel. Trust me, it's not pretty. Lastly, there is one Pokemon available in Oxalis itself, that being a Gift Cyndaquil after taking down a few trainers in a row to prove our worth. Another level 36 evolution joining the party alongside Pidgey is a little rough, but I think with how many we'll have, it'll at least be a rather balanced chunk of time that I'll have them in my party, making it faster overall because I won't have to go to the Pokemon Center as much. With all of them in my possession though, that's all the captures for pre-badge 1. However, we've got to evolve all those suckers, so we're going north to Route 73 for the highest level Pokemon battleable by this point in the game. 
This is a pretty simple process. Simply keep two high level evolutions in the party with four lower level evolutions to switch train them until they can handle the wild Vulpix, Growlithe, Mareep, and Pidgey around, and that amount of power points that they have at that point should be able to carry them to evolve. Though the potential paralysis from Mareep, Static, and Thundershock does make them a little harder to take care of outside of exactly Larvitar and Geodude. And yes, you heard right, abilities are here in Pokemon Prism despite being a Generation 2 ROM hack, and it does make some grinding more irritating thanks to Sturdy, but at least we don't have to deal with that here. Not much else to say about this grind though, everything gets good offensive moves thanks to it being a ROM hack and balanced relatively well, but it is a long grind. But what grind isn't? I am able to evolve Caterpie into Metapod at level 7 and into Butterfree at level 10, Sentret into Furret at level 15, Ralts into Curlia at level 20, Lotad into Lombre at level 14, Cyndaquil into Quilava at level 14, Larvitar into Pupitar at level 20, Spearow into Firo at level 20, Mareep into Flaffy at level 15, Meryl into Azumarill at level 18, Spinarak into Ariados at level 22, Natsu into Zatu at level 25, Zubat into Golbat also at level 22, and into Crobat one level later with the power of friendship, Pidgey evolves at level 18 into Pidgeotto, Paris into Parasect at level 24, Taillow into Swellow at level 22, Geodude into Graveler at level 25, Machop into Machoke at level 28, Flaffy into Ampharos at level 30, Curlia into Gardevoir at level 30, Swinub into Piloswine at level 33, Bronzor into Bronzong at level 33, Auron into Laron at level 32, Quilava into Typhlosion at level 36, Pupitar into Tyranitar at level 40, Pidgeotto into Pidgeot at level 36, Laron into Agron at level 42, and finally Snowrunt into Glalie also at level 42. Now with all of them taken care of, it's time for one final task, getting the Razor Claw. Yeah, we can get Weavile before the Thirst Gym, and this is a nasty, nasty endeavor to try and do so. See, Sneasel is a 1% encounter in the Clathrite Tunnel like I mentioned earlier, and the Razor Claw can be held by Sneasel in battle. However, because it's a 1% encounter, it's really hard to find, and we don't have access to Thief, so we're going to have to capture them. Match on top of that that the Razor Claw is a 1% chance of being held, meaning we have a 0.01% chance of finding a Sneasel with this item. Some people have chosen to omit this from their runs, but I'm a masochist, and somehow, after just over 3 hours and 15 encounters of Sneasel, I was able to find one, leveling up my original Sneasel once during the night to obtain Weavile and give me a total of 54 Pokemon in a time of 56 hours and 19 minutes. <sighs> and guess what? We're gonna have to do the same thing in the next section for Gligar, so hold on to your bums and pray that I get just as lucky. Now with the first gym badge in hand, I can progress up through Route 73 into the Mound Cave, housing several new encounters like Shinx and Gligar on the first floor, so I figured I'd take the time to go ahead and hunt down the Razor Fang, seeing as Gligar's encounter rate is higher than Sneasel's was. So I just get the first one for the decks, what about the second one? <laughs> no shot, no shot whatsoever did I get the Razor Fang this easily. Well then, that's just a single level up away, evolving off of this rival fight right at the beginning and giving me Gliscor. Gotta appreciate it when the game gives it easy to you from time to time. Back in the cave we go and I find Slowpoke, which I need two of, one of which to evolve into Slowking later on, as well as evolving Shinx into Luxio during my grind to find Coughing on the lower floors, as well as Eevee, which is a pretty low encounter rate. So I have to find 8 of these bad boys and girls in order to max out my decks because every single evolution is available. All but one of the evolutions though are available in this section, so strap in. With all of that taken care of though, I'm able to take out the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, shoutouts to the helmet collection behind me, which you can see if you head over to my Twitter, link in the description, perhaps drop a follow while you're there. Also, since there's a nifty minecart here in the cave, I'm able to revisit the Aqua Mines. Now I wasn't able to capture any Pokemon while I was here last time since I had no Pokeballs, but this go around I'm able to grab Makahita, Venonat, and Abra before blowing my way out of this cave with some dynamite and getting myself into Spurge City, which at first I read as Splooge City. 
don't think too many people were expecting a man bazooka juice joke here today, but I guess that's what you sign up for when you watch Chaotic Meatball content. Especially when I just noticed that I managed to put blowing my way out of a cave in the same sentence. Well, there's a few things to do here, first of which being the orphanage. No, it's not real kids, simply Pokemon that have been abandoned by their trainers and need a new home. I'd take them for free, fully evolve them and shove them into my PC to go to hell, but yet clearly that's not good enough for these people. Instead, they want me to give them my Pokemon in exchange for points to redeem first their said Pokemon. I don't understand. Well, since I don't need many of the Pokemon that I already evolved, I can easily dump off most of them in exchange for a Chikorita and a Togepi, though I don't quite have enough points yet for Riolu. I'll wait until I finish up some more encounters, such as the Game Corner encounters right here in the same city. Surprisingly enough though, this Game Corner is a lot more useful than initially thought. There's a matchup game here that gives you rare candies if you manage to find the matching cards, as well as nuggets and poke dolls for free money, all at the cost of 25 coins a pop. Not to mention, you can technically maximize the efficiency by getting one rare candy, one nugget, and three poke dolls per round, giving me a level and 6,500 bucks a pop. So, uh, I guess this is gonna be a lot faster than grinding. I'm sure as hell going to say it is and move on with my day, since that makes my job a whole lot easier. And before you mention it, yes, technically this would probably take a lot more IRL time, but we are going for the fastest in-game time, which this machine should help us with. Anyway, with all of the coins in my possession, I can go ahead and grab Kangaskhan and Porygon, dropping the former off at the orphanage, but still not having the thousand points necessary for that last mod. Well then, I guess it's time to just clear out the rest of the section and get those rare candies. I made sure to keep all of my friendship evolutions in my party, of course the two Eevees and Togepi, as well as the Eevee designated to evolve into Sylveon. See, of course we don't have access to Pokemon Ami like Gen 6 or a way to do the affection mechanic, so the way the developers decided to handle this was to make it so that Eevee would evolve upon having maxed out stat experience in a single stat, then leveling up while knowing a fairy type move. Well, that stat experience requires a boatload of grinding. If you're unfamiliar with how that system works, let me give you a short breakdown. It's the precursor to effort values. Those base stats that all Pokemon have are able to be converted to stat experience upon getting KO'd, and a Pokemon that does KO said Pokemon gets that stat experience. So, for instance, if I KO a Shinx, I'd get 45 HP, 65 attack, 34 defense, 40 special to keep compatibility with the Gen 1 system since that wasn't split yet, despite it not mattering in this ROM hack, it's a leftover from the vanilla Gen 2 games, and 45 speed. So I need to get 65,535 points in a single stat, as this is an arbitrary number that the game can only understand up to, when without vitamin access, and the first fairy type move Eevee learns happening to be charm at level 40, we are going to be in a world of grinding despite the fact that we just had access to rare candies! <sighs> Moving on through the trainers on Route 74 gets me into Heath Village, and while there are Pokemon in both of these locations, I'm moving on south to Route 69, nice, to loop back in on the Naoto region and capture myself a Beniri while I'm here. There are no implications whatsoever when it comes to Beniri being available on Route 69, I swear to god. The trainers here are no sweat, so that's a quick hike back up to Route 74 in order to capture both Cacnea and yet another frustrating 1% encounter in Yanma, available any time other than morning. Then, since I forgot, head back to Route 69 to grab Jigglypuff during the morning. Last area for wild encounters happens to be inside of the Heath Village Gym, which is pretty interesting that wild Pokemon are in here, a bug and grass type gym that houses Yanma. Ah, well, it's, uh, you know, if I read on the guide, Past the words Route 74, I would have read Heath Gym two words later. <laughs> God. Well, at least I can capture Bellsprout while I'm here. Alright, all that's left to do is evolve everybody, and of course donate the ones that I don't need. First things first, there's a Moonstone that was available in Mound Cave that I can use to evolve Jigglypuff into Wigglytuff, and thanks to a few hours of grinding the rare candies from the game corner, which you should statistically be able to get one per in-game minute, I can evolve Coughing into Weezing at level 35, Abra into Kadabra at level 16, Bellsprout into Weepin' Bell at level 21, Yanma into Yanmega at level 33 after learning Ancient Power, 
Kegnia into Cacturn at level 32, Venonat into Venomoth at level 31, and Makahita into Hariyama at level 24 before donating the ones I don't need, then getting Luxio into Luxray at level 30, Slowpoke into Slowbro at level 37, and Chikorita into Bayleaf at level 16, and into Meganium at level 32. This is finally enough donation fodder to give me enough points to get Riolu. Also, since I've had the Eevees in my party for so long, it's relatively easy to just evolve one into Espeon during the day. Now for the fun part. Heath Village has a mart that sells mining picks, and these are pretty instrumental to this section. Thanks to all of those nuggets and Poké Dolls accumulated over the course of a few hours with the rare candies, I'm able to get a few hundred of these, go back into Mound Cave, and just start using these on the wall. Now at first, there is a bit of a problem when it comes to not mining anything up, but your trainer actually has stats as well. The only relevant one though is said mining stat, and the more mining you do, the more the stat increases. This mining can produce every evolutionary stone in the game outside of trade stones, as well as fossils. Now in early versions, since you need a fossil case available in the next section, these can kind of softlock your mining since you can't mine up anything else once obtaining a fossil, so you may need to use save states or soft resets to get around this if you intend on doing the challenge yourself, but it is fixed in the latest version. With all of this mining though, I'm able to get enough stones to evolve Lombre into Ludicolo and Eevee into Vaporeon with Water Stones, Eevee into Jolteon with a Thunderstone, Eevee into Flareon, Vulpix into Ninetales, and Growlithe into Arcanine with Fire Stones, leaving just Weepin' Bell into Victory Bell with a... a... a Firestone? What? Why the hell is the Leaf Stone not working? Huh. Well, this, uh, this tipped me off to take a look at whether or not I had the most updated version, as I had never heard of this being a problem, and turns out I wasn't. Nothing that threw off what encounters I could get, all of that has remained the same, but stuff like the old rod being moved up into Spurge City as opposed to later, and Eevee's evolution into Sylveon would have been messed up. But I figured I'd at least finish out the rest of the available evolutions first, evolving Snowrunt into Frostlass and Curlia into Gallade with Dawnstones, Eevee into Glaceon upon leveling up in the Clathrite Tunnel, as well as the big Eevee grind before patching over and evolving said Eevee into Sylveon at level 40 with Charm and maxed out stat experience. The joys of working with ROM hacks, ladies and gentlemen. Well, now that I've got the old rod and time machine accessible in the Spurge Town Mart, thanks to the gold tokens I've been picking up and, you know, using a guide since I don't know where the fuck these things are, I can change the time back to night in order to evolve Eevee into Umbreon. Then back to daytime for Togepi into Togetek with the power of friendship, and into Togekiss with a shiny stone, then of course Riolu into Lucario, and finally Baneri into Lopunny. Pays to be, walked around for about a million battles for the Sylveon grind, I guess? Alrighty then, all that's left is some unexpected fishing encounters. There are four of them, those being Magikarp wherever the hell you can find water, Feebas in Heath Village, Goldeen on Route 72, and Surskit on Route 69, nice. And that's it, simply evolving them at the rare candies, Magikarp into Gyarados at level 20, Surskit into Masquerain at level 22, and Goldeen into Sea King at level 33 nets us a time of 83 hours and 12 minutes, with a grand total of 110 Pokemon and the most I can get a hold of with only a single badge. Not bad, <laughs> we're nearly halfway done with the decks in a single badge, so I'm sure it'll be smooth sailing from here, right? Well, we'll see, but I highly doubt it. So thankfully, this section is a lot shorter than the last one. However, we've got a few high-level evolutions to take care of. If you remember, I mentioned that we can get a hold of a fossil case during this section, and those happen to be the Gen 3 and 4 fossils, so I figured why not grind up the needed rare candies, and then some so I can carry myself until I get fly outside of battle. Since I can average about one rare candy every 55 seconds of in-game time though, over the course of three in-game hours, I'm able to load myself up with around 200 rare candies, likely putting this place out of business due to the amount of prizing I'm given. We'll also be set on money for the rest of the game, so that'll be super useful. Now that I have access to cut outside of battle, I can head on through Route 74 into Route 75, capturing myself a female Pikachu and an Execute to evolve into Raichu and Executor respectively with the Thunder and Leaf Stones. Now of course the former needs to be female so that it could be bred for Pichu later on in the run, and I don't have access to Ditto, so there we go. Right on the other side of the route happens to be Laurel City, which doesn't contain anything of note, but to the south does. 
Round 76 is the home of the 5% encounter Teddy Ursa, evolving straight into Ursa Ring at level 30, and just ahead of that is the Laurel Forest, home of Shroomish, evolving into Breloom at level 23, and since this is the forest area of the game, our last EV will evolve into Leafeon here by leveling up. Perfect, that just leaves the fossils. Here in Laurel City is the place to resurrect them, and the mountain face in the northeastern part of the city lets me infinitely mine there with the hundreds of mining picks I grabbed in Heath Village. Of course, since these fossils are unnamed, you don't know which one you're going to get until you're told which puzzle you're given inside of the lab, so I did get a few duplicates, but I did manage to find Lilip, Kranidos, and Anorith, evolving the Gen 3 fossils into Cradilly and Armaldo, both at level 40, before finally finding the fossil to resurrect Shield on, evolving the Sinnoh fossils into Rampardos and Bastiodon at level 30. Perfect! All that's left is finding the Trade Stone in this section. I do happen to do the Laurel Forest mission first though, which requires me to go in there with some of my Pokemon to do some requests of the others in there. Similarly to, like, Mystery Dungeon, it's kind of interesting how they managed to weave this into a mainstream Pokemon, like, formula, I guess. Though I can't capture anything in here, so sadly no Wartortle or Trap Inch. Here I can unlock the gym, but no Trade Stone. That's because it's in the Mart. I can trade in two gold tokens, which like I've said are scattered across the map, and I managed to find two more before getting here, evolving Machoke into Machamp with it. And with that, that's a total of 128 Pokemon and a time of 89 hours and 7 minutes going into Leader Brooklyn, destroying her fairy types and allowing me to continue. Well that section wasn't so bad. Oh, okay, free Toted Isle upon exiting the gym, I will take it. And thanks to those rare candies I spent hours grinding, I can evolve it straight into Croconaw at level 18 and into Feraligator at level 30. Okay, before I move on from this city though, I want to backtrack to Route 75 and grab myself a second Execute. I'll need it for an in-game trade coming up here in Terenia City, and I'd hate to be unprepared. Also, since it seems like I'm running low on rare candies, I figured I'd spend a little bit more time in the game corner before progressing too far away from Spurge City, then I remember I deposited about 50 or so in the PC earlier, so I think I can make it through this section with enough. After making it through the hell of a puzzle that is the Magikarp Tunnel, I'm spit back out and told I can progress. Neato. I'm able to go through Rural Forest into Terenia City, and the in-game trade I mentioned earlier is here for a Drifloon named Carl. Well then, Carl, time to become a dumpy air balloon named Driftblim and go into my box forever. Sorry, bucko. With that done though, there's one little side area in this town that I've got to take care of, and that's the Pachisi board. It's a little board game that lets you move spaces depending on what you roll, and there's wild Pokemon spaces here, so not only luck on whether you land on the space you want, but luck on what encounters you'll find. Woohoo, I, I love double luck, it truly is my favorite thing. It takes a bit, but I'm able to find Tentacool on a water space, evolving it into Tentacruel at level 30, Absol and Scyther from Grass Spaces, and Onyx, Rhyhorn, and Torkoal from Sandy Spaces, making it to the end on one of the runs and earning myself a shiny ball. This is a special type of Pokeball in this game that allows for whatever Pokemon caught inside of it to become the shiny variant. Pretty neat if I do say so myself. With them obtained though and evolving Rhyhorn into Rhydon at level 42, I'm able to move west of the city onto Route 83 and capture Electrike, evolving it straight away into Maynectric at level 26 before hunting for the 1% encounter chance of Chingling. I managed to find it after about 40 encounters, which is pretty good when it comes to the odds. Then I capture it and move forward to realize that I've looped in again on Nalo. Man, there's a lot of small circles in this region. It's kind of nice for when you don't have access to fly, but we're going to have it shortly. To the south of Terenia City happens to be Route 77, the home of Challenge Pissing. How does it work? If you can piss six feet in the air straight up and not get wet, you get no down payment. Don't wait. Don't delay. Don't fuck with us. The home of the Pokemon Daycare, but it's a little too far south and I've got a guard that's blocking me from being able to access it. However, I can take the Magnet Train here in Terenia over to the Region region, you know, because they were original. This is the one from Pokemon Brown, and there are indeed multiple regions in this game, and in fact, 20 badges! There's still only 251 Pokemon though, so at least I'm not going to be buried in Mons to evolve. Here in Botan City lies the Haunted Forest, which houses Pokemon like Ghastly, evolving into Haunter at level 25, and Shuppet, evolving into Bayonet at level 37. 
This leaves me to grab Sableye inside of the Haunted Mansion's entrance, and after tagging the six colored tombstones in the correct order, I'm able to get the key to enter it and clear it of any problems housed inside, which then opens up the ability to challenge the next gym leader. Of course, I still have one more evolution to take care of, that being Chingling into Chimeco through the power of nighttime friendship. I had been switch training it on practically every trainer in this section since I've gotten it, so it's a single rare candy needed to evolve, no skin off my back, giving me a total of 150 Pokemon and a time of 91 hours and 50 minutes. Here I'm able to challenge Edison and obtain our fourth gym badge. Huh, Edison, dark type user, sounds like somebody enjoys a certain Yu-Gi-Oh format. Well, our next section's pretty easy in terms of encounters, only 13 new mons in fact. After opening up the southern end of Route 77 with our shiny new gym badge, it's breeding time. We've got Raichu and Wigglytuff available at this moment to breed with my male Breloom due to being part of the same egg group, giving me eggs and hatching into Pichu and Iglybuff respectively. Figured I'd want to do that just so that I could get the mons I need to evolve inside of the party without having to backtrack out of the Milos Catacombs. The first floor of this new fancy dungeon is the home of Numo, evolving into Camera Upt at level 33. Then on the second basement floor, I can grab Ponyta at any time, evolving into Rapidash at level 40, as well as Mawile. But here comes the asshole Space Frocks. Lunatone is available during the night at a 1% rate, as well as Soul Rock at 1% during the day. Now, if I had known there was an in game trade for Lunatone, trading away Soul Rock up in the next town, I wouldn't have wasted a literal hour's worth of time trying to find one. The guide that I was going off of definitely seemed like it was from somebody that didn't actually finish the run, as they had mentioned capturing a team of Teddy Ursas since they have pickup, and you can use them for the rare candy grind like you would in a vanilla Pokemon game. But nowhere was the game corner in Spurge City mentioned, so I suppose that's a simpler but less effective route to go by, but I digress. After a neat little puzzle that reminds me a lot of Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, especially after getting the item that lets me hop over small pits, jeez, what a novel concept for a Pokemon game, I'm able to take out the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers once again, arriving at the northern end of Felicia Town, but only disguised as said Power Ranger. The cops are looking to apprehend them for doing some illegal things, and of course my naive player character goes along with it, grabbing the Black Ranger and tossing him towards the officer for arrest. Could it have been any other color? What the f***? Well, uh, I guess with that under control, I can move to the west of Fallacia and directly south in order to hit Route 78, the home of both Skaroopy and Pineco, evolving respectively into Drapion at level 40, and... Damn it, I'm out of rare candies. Well, at least I gained access to fly in this section, so I can restock without it being a problem. I figured I'd get just enough for Fortress to evolve at level 31, since it's the last Pokemon I'll need to evolve before hitting the 5th gym leader, Andre, with a total of 163 Pokemon in a time of 94 hours 55 minutes, kicking his karate bum into next week and getting me one step closer to completing this Pokedex. Looking ahead for our future encounters, I notice that there's not much in this section that requires many levels. Only three Pokemon need to evolve by level up, but many in the next section need to be in the 40s or even 50s to evolve. So I figured I'd take around another 3 hour chunk of time to grab nearly 200 rare candies, which should give me enough to clear out through this game's Elite Four. Back to Felicia we go, and to the east is Route 85, but beyond that, with Rock Smash outside of battle, is the Firelight Caverns, housing only a single Pokemon in Slugma, evolving into Mad Cargo at level 38. This is a very simple dungeon to get through, though there is a statue of a mysterious Pokemon on the bottom floor. Hmm, I wonder what that'll be for later on. We do have to come back here shortly, but we've got a park challenge to take on on the other side of this lava cave system in the Provincial Park. Similarly to the bug catching contest in Johto, there's a park challenge that allows me to capture Pokemon, this time out of shrines instead of tall grass, where I can grab Tangela during the weekend challenge, evolving into Tangrowth at level 36 while knowing ancient power, then with the regular challenge, I can get Magmar, which I do have the Magmarizer for thanks to the Firelight Caverns, but I still need a Trade Stone, so we'll have to wait on that. Gibble, evolving into Gabite in a single level and into Garchomp at level 48, and Golem during the night. This is one of the many Pokemon that are trade evolutions that are obtainable, hence why we use the Trade Stone on Machoke. Speaking of which, I can grab Scizor during the morning of the challenge, putting another one of those trade evolutions away, then Illumise and Volbeat during the day to finish up. 
That leaves exactly two Pokemon for this section. First of which though, I need the Good Rod for, which is obtainable from a fisherman on Route 81, which we can get to from the eastern exit of the Provincial Park. This encounter ends up being rather hard to find, seeing as documentation on how fishing works in this game seems to be rather sparse. But upon trying the Good Rod in every location accessible up to this point, I managed to find a way into Mound Cave by using Cut on Route 69, nice, to get into a previously unavailable section of it, and just inside that houses Relicanth. With one more Pokemon to go, that needs a little bit more story progression. The Egg in the Firelight Caverns ends up being a section that I can only now access thanks to delivering this old man's Aggron to him after grabbing it from his home on Route 80 to the east of Route 81, taking out the Power Rangers once more, though they only have three members left. Their plan is to bring back the Guardians of Nalho, which end up actually being some cool fake mons. These are Varanius, Libabeel, Fambaco, Boncero, and Raiwato. Interesting names, I suppose, but before they've been taken away from the police, they've only managed to awaken Varanius, meaning it's time for a legendary hunt. I just found an area where I could go between loading zones without having to enter a route gate or anything, eventually finding it after going between Spurge City and Route 74 for about 20 minutes, and since the developers were kind and generous, he doesn't run away immediately! <laughs> this gives me the chance to lower his health, then chuck a few Ultra Balls and capture him. Finishing the section and letting me fight Acania Doc's gym leader Ayaka, which gives me the Haze Badge. 6 down, 14 to go. Well, only 2 more to get to the Naho League, but you get what I mean. So this section is actually for the next 2 badges. There's nothing in between the 7th and 8th badges, but this is one of the bigger sections this game has to offer. However, now that I have access to Surf outside of battle, it's time to do some backtracking as well as getting to some new areas. Just to the east of the Acania Docks is Route 68, the home of Bagon. Now this does take quite a few rare candies to evolve, but I am able to get it into Shelgon at level 30, and into Salamence at level 50. By the looks of it, I might actually have enough rare candies to last me until the end of the game, not just the Elite Four, due to the amount of Pokemon I don't actually have to level up during that portion of the game. I've also got to return to the Aqua Mines, seeing as I can capture Chinchu while surfing there, evolving it into Lantern at level 27, then deep inside the cave lies another of the Nalho Guardians, Libabeel. I'm not sure if I vibe with the design of this one, but it doesn't put up much of a fight and I'm able to capture it within 8 Ultra Balls. Not bad whatsoever, seems like these legendaries don't have a catch rate of 3 if these easy ones are anything to go by. Moving back down to Route 80 to the east of the Provincial Park leads me to find a Whalmer evolving into Whalelord at level 40, and that is all the backtracking I need to do for now. I can head back to Veselia City and head south onto Route 78, the home of the Nalho Ruins. Now, there are a ton of encounters here, such as Trapinch evolving into Vibrava at level 35 and into Flygon at level 45, as well as Loudred, which evolves into Exploud at level 40, both in the base area. Of course, I'll need to breed that Loudred later on, but for now I can move into the ruins themselves, getting the four jewels necessary to get the Prism Jewel and get the fake ID from the man on the left side of the base area, as I need to get by that guard on the other side of the waterway here to progress. However, as I said, there are a ton of Pokemon to grab here first. On the first floor of the maze lies Donphan, Beldum, evolving into Matang in a single level and into Metagross at level 45, as well as the unfortunately 1% Mistrevis, who I would evolve right now, but I deposited all of my desk stones into the PC. Whoops. The second floor doesn't have anything new, but the third houses Duskull, a common 30% encounter, thankfully, but the fourth curses us yet another time for a 1% Spiritomb. Gotta say, damn does this sprite look really good in 8-bit, one of the neatest in the game I've gotta admit. Last but not least, a yet another 1% encounter on the 5th floor in Swablu. Alright, now with all of those captures, I can withdraw the ones that didn't make it into my party, evolving Swablu into Altaria at level 35, Duskull into Dusclops at level 37, and Mistrevis into Mismagius with a Duskstone. I'll save the breeding for the end of this section, but for now I've got to use my handy dandy fake ID to get into Route 79 and into... Oh, uh, never mind, I guess my player character gets arrested for the fake ID. Uh, makes sense I guess, but we've got to make it out of the prison and the cage keys here allow me to do that, capturing an Electabuzz on the second floor of the prison, though I do make sure to visit the basement floor in order to free one of the Pokemon we'll be capturing later on, that being the third of the Nalho Guardians, but we'll get to him in a little bit. 
Also, while taking out my rival and getting the HM for strength, which I can already use outside a battle, which gets me out of the prison, but not before capturing a Houndour in the outside ground's grass, evolving into Houndoom in a single level. Well then, only a few things to do now. First things first, now that I have access to strength, I can go ahead and grab a trade stone from the Milo's Catacombs, evolving Kadabra into Alakazam with it, before doing the last capture of the section, that being said Guardian Fambako, over on Route 82 to the east of Terenia City. He again doesn't put up much of a fight, so all that's left is the breeding. It doesn't take me long for Magmar and the Flame Body ability to hatch myself a Fanpy, Wismer, and Elekid, finishing off the section with a total of 210 Pokemon and a time of 106 hours and 20 minutes. Man, that bulk of time really was just the beginning of the game without candies and that stupid Sylveon grind, wasn't it? Well, since there's no Pokemon between badges 7 and 8, I can go ahead and run through the remainder of the story until the Spurge City Gym opens up, allowing me to challenge Bruce and giving me the Nalho badge. Yes, a badge named after the region, but it's actually kind of cool since you refight many of the previous gym leaders as gym trainers in here, which is a neat little culmination point of your journey. I'd love to see a vanilla Pokemon game try this out, but with that, it's time for the pre-Elite 4 section. Oddly enough, this section only holds three Pokemon, since I can now surf east of Acania Dock past where we previously got Bagon, as I now hold the eight badges of Nalho, giving me access to Route 67, but instead of proceeding onto this game's version of Victory Road, instead I can head east onto the Ember Brook, as this pathway leads to the Sevi Islands, and most notably, Mount Ember itself. Anyone who's played Fire Red and Leaf Green knows exactly what that means, and it's time to capture the first of the legendary birds, Moltres. He doesn't put up much of a fight like many of the other Guardians of Nalho before, so I'm able to capture the fried chicken fairly quickly, allowing me to proceed onto Route 67 again into Route 65 to the west, and just ahead of that is the Seneca Caverns, this game's version of Victory Road. There's not much of interest here except for one thing. Off the beaten path and behind some strength rocks houses a tunnel that leads to Articuno, the second of the legendary birds, who again doesn't stand much of a chance before I capture it in around 7 Ultra Balls. See what I mean about this not seeming like the standard legendary catch rate of 3? Well that's 2 out of 3 Pokemon I need for this section, so proceeding through the badge gates, I'm able to hit some grass that houses the once again, 1% encounter, Ditto, who oddly enough is the highest level Pokemon in the entire route, so I can grab my Armaldo out of the PC as it's level 40, and Repel trick out Ditto to find it much faster than I would have initially, finishing off the section with a total of 213 Pokemon at a time of 109 hours and 45 minutes, whipping the booties of all four elites and our player character's father, Lance. This finally reunites us with our mother from the beginning of the game, and to think we did all that because of a rock slide that blocked us in. Now that Lance has bestowed upon us the region pass though, you remember the tunnel that was initially on Route 70 way at the beginning of the game? Now we can actually proceed through it and make it into region proper. That's right, just like Generation 2, Prism borrows from its Generation 1 counterpart in Brown to give a revamped version of the region five years later. However, this is really unheard of for a ROM hack, so this is pretty cool to see. Similarly to the Professor Oak's challenge of the Johto games though, we can basically go through the entirety of this region without getting a single gym badge and scout for every single Pokemon available before taking on all eight of them in sequence, so let's go ahead and do that. The Ridge on Tunnel spits us out on Route 58, just north of Castro Valley, which is a pretty nice place to be sent to, all things considered, as this town, the Castro Village, contains the Super Rod and a coast in order to capture a Milotic. Heading west through a few areas to Route 60 and the home of the Region Power Plant gives me Magnemite on the inside, evolving into Magneton at level 30 and into Magnezone one level later while inside of the plant. Next up is the Move Relearner, which is over in Moraga Town, as we can evolve that Pila Swine that I have rotting in the PC, since turns out Mamo Swine is in the game, I just didn't have it on the guide since whoever wrote it didn't put it on there. After reteaching it Ancient Power by Heart Scale, it evolves into Mamoswine in one level. Now in the westernmost point of the region, just to the south of Seaside Town, is Route 53, housing two new encounters of Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan, and like Ditto, they are both the highest level Pokemon on the route, so I can grab any level 20 out of the box and repel trick them out to get them ASAP. Last capture before we grab Legendaries is within Igaloo City, as this game's version of the Safari Zone, Igaloo Park, resides here, housing Chansey, so we capture... 
Oh. I can't use balls here. I have to talk to the receptionist first. Well then, I sure do love finding 1% encounters twice. It sure is absolutely fantastic, and I don't hate it whatsoever! <sighs> With Chansey in the party, though, I figured it's time to do some legendary hunting. The first two are actually kind of weird. There's these gold and silver eggs lying around the region, one in Hayward City and one on Route 56, both of which can be traded for actual eggs inside of Hayward City itself, and after a ridiculous amount of time walking these eggs, even when it's halved with Magmar in the party, I'm finally able to hatch out ho -Oh and Lugia. Strange, eggs with legendaries, but I suppose I will take it. This is why I wanted to grab Chansey first, though. I knew this walking was going to take an eternity, and with all that friendship being generated, it needed to go somewhere useful. And sure enough, we can quickly evolve it. The vitamins that are now obtainable from the Hayward City Department Store are easily buyable with how much money we have, so I can load up Chansey with 50 vitamins, leveling it up once to evolve into Blissey. Back in Nanalho we go as there's no daycare in Rijon, and I need to spit out a Tyrogue. No Happini since it doesn't exist in this game. Thanks to some save scumming and a few vitamins from Hayward City, it evolves into Hitmontop with equal attack and defense stats. Back to legendaries, and with two of the cage keys that I had left over from the prison arc, I'm able to head to the haunted mansion inside of Botan City, unlocking a cage that contains a warp tile to a very glitched out area of the game. Oddly enough, this houses the third legendary bird, but not Zapdos. No, instead we have a custom legendary bird by the name of Foncero. Pretty creative using the fourth one as the Spanish word for zero mixed into the name, and a neat callback to the missing no glitch in Gen 1, as the game's reasoning for that happening was due to this Pokemon. Really cool. The last three legendaries are a bit similar to ho -Oh and Lugia, but instead of hatching from eggs, I find eggs in the Haunted Forest, Route 75, and Castro Forest, labeled the Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald eggs, so you know what time it is. After trading them for the red, blue, and green orbs, I'm able to go capture Groudon from the Firelight Caverns, as this was the thing in the basement I alluded to much earlier in the challenge, Kyogre from the Clathrite Tunnel after the craziest strength puzzle I have ever completed, and Rayquaza from the Milo's Catacombs after climbing a really, really, really tall ladder. Boy, that third one was anticlimactic. So what's the last Pokemon available? Well, there's a Trade Stone available inside of the Silk Tunnel, accessible from Moraga Town on the 5th basement floor, which I am able to use to evolve Haunter into Gengar, finishing off the section with a total of 231 Pokemon and a time of 115 hours and 56 minutes, taking out all 8 of Rijon's gym leaders in order because I'm weird, giving me 16 badges and enough to progress. Oddly enough, this game doesn't just have 16 badges like the Johto games, instead we've got 20! but we can get all but a single Pokemon remaining before obtaining said badges, so let's go do so. In Seaside Town, the Pokemon lab there, like Oak Slab and Pallet Town, houses all three Kanto starters, giving me Bulbasaur, Squirtle, and Charmander. Though you do need a few gold tokens to get all of them. By this point though, you'll have more than enough by talking to an NPC over in Merson City, since he gives you four gold tokens for every 30 Pokemon in your Pokedex. These are the only three Pokemon we need to evolve in this section, however, we don't quite have enough rare candies for them, though we do have about 10 each for them. Thanks to Rijon's trainers being full of level 70-ish Pokemon, I can clear out the path north of Ausari City on Cycling Road, which I'll need to use to get to Johto later anyway, in order to evolve Bulbasaur into Ivysaur at level 16 and into Venusaur at level 32, Charmander into Charmeleon at level 16 and into Charizard at level 36, and last but not least, Squirtle into Wartortle at level 16 and into Blastoise at level 36. Alright, now that they're taken care of, it's time to get the remaining needed 8 trade stones to evolve our evolutions for the section. These are available as rewards from the Battle Arcade, an area only accessible after getting all 8 Rijon Gym badges, taking a ferry from Castro Valley, and fighting the computers over there over and over again to get enough points to redeem for 8 trade stones. Those being Magmar into Magmortar while holding the Magmarizer, Electabuzz into Electivire while holding the Electorizer, Slowpoke into Slowking while holding the King's Rock, Rhydon into Rhyperior while holding the Protector, Onyx into Steelix while holding the Metal Coat, and Dusclops into Dust Noir while holding the Reaper Cloth. 
Now, I am missing two of the items, so I've got to go retrieve the upgrade and dubious disc, as they were the only two items I managed to miss across the game, finishing up evolving Porygon into Porygon 2, then into Porygon Z with those respective items, finishing off the section with a total of 248 Pokemon and a time of 119 hours and 34 minutes. Well then, with Whitney and Bugsy of the Johto region, Sabrina of Kanto, and... Ernest from Toonod? Wait, what the hell is Pokemon Glaze doing here? I just did a Nuzlocke using only dark types through this game, so this is a pretty cool easter egg that I wouldn't have understood otherwise. Really cool. And with them defeated, all that's left is exactly one legendary, the fourth and last guardian of Nalho, but for that we need a grappling hook. This is only obtainable off of the second bingo card over in Phlockstown, probably the only town that wasn't relevant in Nalho until now. This first card was very easy to finish, however the second has exactly one task on there that requires some serious time and effort, that being beat a battle tower tycoon. So yeah, we need to prepare. I made sure to grab from my box Garchomp, Metagross, and Lucario, then pumped them each with all five vitamins ten times over, then as much stat experience as I could muster. Then I took on the challenge and surprisingly enough hit the 20 win streak on my second attempt, fighting and beating Towerhead Candela in order to finish the bingo card, get the grappling hook, and head to the top of the Nalho ruins. This grappling hook lets me hit the roof, and this makes me battle and capture Raiwato with the Master Ball, fortunately given to me by Blue over in Saffron City after I managed to beat Sabrina, finishing the challenge off with 249 Pokemon and a time of 126 hours and 53 minutes. Whew, wow, I did not expect that one to take so long, especially after all of the rare candies that could be farmed from Spurge City. I kind of expected this to be below 100 hours, but I suppose that's what happens when you do a bunch of item hunting, walking for eggs, battle facilities for trade stones and bingo cards, the works. This was my first time truly completing Pokemon Prism, and it is a fantastic game. I'd highly suggest giving it a shot if you haven't tried it before. And before you ask, I should probably mention that yes, Snorlax, Zapdos, Mewtwo, and Mew are technically in the Pokedex, but as of the last update, version 0.94 build 237, they are unobtainable. This update was released back in 2020, and I highly doubt we'll ever see them integrated, but with the amount of content in this game, I don't think they really need to be. This is a fulfilling experience regardless of their lack of presence, and I've got to thank everyone who's worked on this game, even through Nintendo's cease and desist before this released, and to whoever managed to leak this game through that, thank you the most because that's the person that we have responsible for being able to experience this. With all that said though, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this ROM hack, why not check out some of these other videos on screen featuring some other fantastic ROM hacks, you'll probably enjoy them too. Stay safe. Stay healthy, and I'll see you next time.